everyone, and welcome to another amazing episode of The Joy of Being for busy working moms and women in business and beyond who are seeking to unplug from their worries and overwhelm to light up with insight and joy. I, your host, mom, and effortless lifestyle coach, Marina Pearson, talk to transformational professionals, business owners, and creatives about what it really takes to have a business and life you can truly enjoy. If you enjoyed the show or had any questions, why not connect with me on Instagram at Marina Pearson? Look out for the show's meme and make a comment there, or just click on my story and ask me a question. Alternatively, you can find me on the Joy of Being Facebook group. And if you would like a more personalized touch to live a stress-free life, then why not find out more about the Joy of Being Retreat, an intimate four-day profound experience at a luxury venue in Javier, Spain, where you get to experience your inner calm and peace of mind by slowing down and making space. To find out more, email me at marina, marinapearson.com with Joy of Being Retreat in the title. So on today's show, I interviewed Celeste Yvonne and We talked about her journey to sobriety. Celeste is actually a popular blogger and personality who writes about all things parenting. In fact, last year, her dear husband post went viral to tens of millions of readers around the world. Celeste shares her frustrations with the invisible workload for mums and pressures we face to run the household, even as many of us return to work. Her writing really resonates with mothers everywhere and she speaks with the candor and honesty that is unusual in the world of filters, which is actually why I was attracted to her in the first place. She admits to her struggles with alcohol and writes about the mummy wine culture and pressure to self-medicate that almost pulled her under. Now one year sober, she writes about the decision to be sober, which started with her kids and has ultimately helped her to define her own sense of self. And this is what we really focused on in this conversation. We talked about the whys and wherefores of sobriety. We also talked about her journey. We also explored the possibility that self-medication with wine is a way for us to not feel what we don't want to feel because that we don't haven't found another way or we haven't realized that actually feeling discomfort isn't such a bad thing so she talks candidly and openly about her journey we discussed other ways uh, to support ourselves and the conversation took an interesting turn when we started to talk about asking for help and how that can really actually support us on this journey of motherhood instead of looking at a wine bottle to help us instead. So if you are finding yourself having a wine too many and wishing that you hadn't, and deep down you know that there's some sort of, it's some sort of a way to self-medicate, then I invite you to listen. And I think this will be an amazing episode for you. Enjoy. Once again, another week. And on today's show, we've got the beautiful Celeste. And I have been roaming around Instagram, reading people's posts, but mainly mummy's posts. And Celeste was one of those posts that caught my eye. And then I got curious about Celeste and I got curious about where she's at and what she's up to and and what she likes to write about. And she's actually really funny. So um, I love to read her posts. And as a result of that, I realized that she's actually writing about something that's very, 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 very pertinent to um, being a mum and also sobriety and how often as a mother, the role as mothers can lead us to drink. (laughs) She has a very cool story to tell and which is why I decided to bring her on the podcast today. So welcome, Celeste. Thank you, Marina. I'm so happy to be here. So let me start with what got you, so you're having this year of sobriety. You've had the year already? Yes. I just completed um, my first year sober in December. So um, I'm going on about 14 months now. Nice. So share a little bit about where you were before you made this decision and, and then a little bit more about what had you make the decision and how different your life is now. Yeah. So um, I... I'm a a mom with two little kids and I'm a wife. Um, I've got two boys ages two and four. So they're very young and we're very much in the the thrust of things where, you know, there's, it's, it's a crazy house. There's screaming, there's Legos everywhere. Um, There's 
no such thing as quiet in my life right now. Um, I was at a point when I decided to quit drinking um, last December, um, where through the chaos um, and through the struggle and the stress, um, I was drinking too much. Um, a night wasn't complete if I didn't have at least probably three glasses of wine, um, sometimes more. Mm. And um, I was using wine mostly, sometimes beer, but mostly wine to self-medicate um, and to find that, that relaxation after a day of fully being wound up. Um, so I, found, I was finding that calm through my wine um, that I very much needed um, from the kids screaming, from all the needs having to be met, um, from putting everybody before me mm. all day. Mm. I found this stress release through wine every night as a coping mechanism. Um, and I probably would have kept going, except um, I I found I was getting headaches in the morning. Um, I had less energy in the morning. And um, I started to get fearful for my health. Um, my father uh, was an extremely active alcoholic um, who had a severe stroke at age 50. Um, and it has, I'm approaching age 40. That, that it, number 50 doesn't seem so far off anymore. And it was... <laughs> <laughs> terrifying, terrifying um, to think that that could have been me or that could be me or that might be me if I keep going at the rate I'm going. And um, I've seen the impact that had on my dad's life. He's still alive. He's almost 80, but um, he can't walk. He has a live-in nurse. He needs somebody to wipe his ass. <laughs> I don't want that for me. I certainly don't want that for my kids or my husband. And um, I saw myself going down that slippery slope um, also realizing the impact this was having on my kids. Um, I remember specifically one night and it, it wasn't the night I chose to get sober, but it was one night where I was going on probably beer number three. And, um, I had just finished that. And I asked my son to get me a beer for me. He's, he was four at the time. And he said, why mom, you just had a beer. Why? <laughs> you know, part of me is like, you're just a kid. You wouldn't understand. And the other part of me was like, oh my God, is this what my kids are going to remember about mom? You know, like, oh, I remember always fetching her a beer. You know, I always remember a glass in her hand. I mean, they're still so young, I, but I don't want that in their memories. I don't want to be remembered as that mom. Um, I had to deal with that with my dad. I don't want that for my kids. So, um, so many things came through. Um, the other thing that also happened during this time was my husband was going through a little bit of a midlife crisis. And um, I had this fear in me that my kids couldn't have two kids impacted in life. Um, one going through depression and one who couldn't remain sober. Um, I felt like I needed to sober up and get my act together because we needed somebody who could remain in the thrust of things, who could be available during an emergency. And right now, I didn't feel comfortable that there was somebody like that there. So um, all these things collided um, one, one Monday in December, and um, I had a panic attack. Um, and I went in, I thought I was having a stroke because that's where my head likes to take me to the very worst case scenario. And um, it was that moment where I realized um, I can't do this. This is dangerous. I'm, I'm playing Russian roulette with my life by um, drinking this much. And um, I can't, my kids deserve more than this. So that's how it got me to today. Um, I'm, Almost 450 days sober <laughs> and counting. So, yeah, it's exciting. So it sounds to me that 
you woke up to something new for yourself, like there was a sense of like waking up to like, oh, hang on a second. This is maybe not the best way to actually live my life. And as a result of that, what have you noticed? So what have you noticed that that you're doing, that you're feeling, that you're experiencing that you weren't before or that is quite unexpected for you? When you um, are sober after years of consistent drink- drinking, your whole body changes. Um, you can smell things better. You taste things better. You feel all the feelings, even the feelings that you were trying to drown out, and you learn to live with them. But one of the greatest things I've discovered about myself, and it was something I was most afraid of, was I'm actually a nicer person sober. Mm-hmm. I'm funnier. Um, I have more energy, which is huge when you're a mom, right? You need energy. Yeah, you do. I have more energy. I, I'm sharper and um, I'm just, I feel like I'm a more well-rounded, better person for my kids. Mm. Um, I'm more patient with them. Um, all the things that I was hoping to find solace through from a bottle, I feel like I found it in the exact opposite. A lot of the times I was drinking because in social situations, I thought I'd be more comfortable, more relaxed, maybe more engaging. People might like me more. And I feel like the opposite's true. And I found that in myself. I really do like who I am better when I'm sober. And I like the person my kids are seeing too. My kids are seeing a very active mom um, somebody who takes self care. I take self care very seriously. Um, I have my me time, and I use it mostly to exercise, but also to take baths, um, to get massages. Like I, I found self care in a whole different way that is um, good for me, and my kids are seeing that. And I feel like in ten years or whenever I have to have that conversation with them um, about going to a party and drinking, I'm not going to be a hypocrite about it. I'm not going to be like, don't drink because it's not good for you. And um, it's very dangerous. And they'll be like, wait, (laughs) who have I just been living with for the past 10 years? Um, I feel like I can more um, be more openly honest and say, um, I want this for you. And I've shown you what life looks like sober and it's so good. Mm. And I want, I want you to be responsible um, when, you, when it's your turn. Um, and I want, I want my kids to learn um, about moderation, but also about sobriety. And I, I just want them to learn and not the hard way. I feel like I learned the hard way. <laughs> and through some open dialogue, um, I want them to see uh, what life can be like and that, you know, you don't have to drink to have fun, which I feel like in our culture is a very unusual message that you do not hear very often. That kind of leads me on to the sort of next question I had, which was obviously you said when I reached out to you, you said you're writing a book and I kind of want to open this up to society. Like, well, what have you seen? Because obviously when we're in it, I mean, I, I really resonate with your story. I used to drink a lot as well and then realized that um, it was probably not the best. Like I just felt started to feel really just really shit every yeah. every morning and I'm like actually it's a bit like going to the gym is like oh I'm like oh I don't want to go and then you feel amazing afterwards or whatever and then you realize actually you're going you're going or you're not doing because it actually makes more sense to do it that way um because of the way that you experience it as opposed to the knee-jerk reaction of like I'm going to get a drink because I'm thinking that right now and that's really what I want um so I'm curious about now that you're kind of an observer of it because you're no longer in it. What have you observed about society? What have you observed about the drinking culture among mothers? Um, what are you noticing? What, what struck you? What, what are some of the insights that you've had? When I was fully uh, gripped by, by the alcohol, I will tell you that a lot of the wine culture spoke to me um, and it encouraged me. It was justification for um, drinking and drinking a lot. Um, For me, it was really dangerous because I used it um, to fuel uh, progressively drinking more and more. And that's so um, terrifying because 
it worries. I mean, I think a lot of us do that. Um, you see the wine memes, um, or the, um, there's articles out there saying, you know, moderate drinking is actually extremely healthy. Um, and everyone goes nuts and shares them like crazy. Um, but the wine memes that show, um, saying, I'll just have a glass and the wine glass is like the size of your head, you know, <laughs> I'll just have a glass. Um, or you see the, uh, the moms drinking out of the bottle because they think it's funny. There's, um, there, it, wine, mommy wine culture is a really big thing right now. It's hard to miss. Um, when I was fully um, transfixed with wine, I would share those memes. I would read them and laugh. And I, I wanted everyone around me to laugh too, because I was like, oh, mommy needs wine. You know, this is, it's, been a, it's been a hard day. Mommy needs wine. Um, because I thought it was funny, but also because I wanted people to laugh with me. I want, you got this. And... Um, I, so I really use that um, as fuel to my fire. Um, looking back now, um, and I can see it in a different light, and I see it, first of all, it's everywhere. I, I mean, you cannot be on social media and not see it um, everywhere. And um, I, I don't know if I look at it much differently now, except that I will admit sometimes I see those memes and I still get a little pang in my stomach. Like, oh, I wish I had a glass of wine. Which is funny because I've, I feel like I've gotten so... Um, I've gotten so beyond that point, but it still um, elicits emotion in me, which is scary for the for the people out there who aren't in my situation and they don't have 14 months under their belt and maybe they are drinking too much um, because that's not what they need. They don't need advertising out there to encourage them to not just drink. I mean, nobody is just saying, just have a glass of wine um, and you'll be all good. I mean, these means are encouraging massive amounts of wine, I feel like. And it's, it's dangerous. Um, I don't think it's good for anybody because nobody should be drinking that much. And also... I I feel, and I, I posted this on my Instagram not too long ago. Even if you are a drinker and you know how to drink in moderation, I feel like the joke's over. <laughs> I feel like the joke was there. Let's move on. Let's find another joke because now you can't go anywhere without it just being blasted. I was walking through Target. And there's for Valentine's, just give me my wine and stuff like that. Um, and, and speaking from this point in my sobriety, but it's been going on for so long. I just want to be over it. Um, with uh, Let's move on. Let's find a new joke. Um, <laughs> let's find something else that mommy might need. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, something a little healthier, perhaps. So, something that came to mind when you were talking was an interesting idea that I hadn't really thought about, but just kind of showed up in my awareness just now, which is the sense of we use it as a crutch. I say we, I mean, I used to, and because I wasn't coping very well and I didn't know what else to do. So, a sense of like, I, if I look back onto those times, I was definitely not looking after myself. I was definitely not supporting myself. I was definitely not asking for help. I was definitely attempting to do everything. It was all up to me, but somehow everybody else was to blame. There was, there was that sort of conversation going on in my head at the time, or at least noticing behaviors that, that were very much around, I need support. Well, this is the very thing that's going to support me. A bit like when a child acts out, they're not doing it to hate someone. They're doing it because they don't have any, they don't know what else to do. So I'm curious if that resonates for you. I'm curious whether there was a sense of like, actually now what else can support me? Like if I don't have this drink, actually what else? Yeah. Are there other, other, uh, uh, you know, are there other things that I can do that can support me that are actually more helpful? 
I'm pondering this one. So this takes us to a whole different conversation. Um, and this is something I talk about a lot too, which is emotional labor, um, which is the mental load that moms carry that where we aren't just taking care of kids. For some of us, we're taking care of kids. We're doing, uh, we're probably going to work too. But even if we're staying at home, we are managing the family schedule. We're determining what's for dinner every night. We're making sure dinner gets on the table every night. We're making sure Bobby has uh, a ride to his soccer game um, and that somebody planned the snacks for the whole team. Um, and then who's taking little Joey on the field trip? That's the mental load. Um, and it's something that mostly women are known for carrying. Um, I have heard from some of my followers that that they have husbands that do it. And that is fantastic. Um, but that's not common. Uh, the majority of in partnerships, it's the women doing the mental load um, or carrying the, the majority of the mental load. To load, and I think that's that makes sense because, um, from what I understand about men's brains, is they compartmentalize, and women's brains don't. So we can take that on, but it's heavy. The mental load is heavy, and um, one of my most viral pieces. It went. I mean, it went nuts last year to more than ten million people. Wow! Um, was a letter I wrote to my husband called "Dear Husband." And if you Google it, you can probably find it just by Googling dear husband. I read it. I need more help. Mm -hmm. That piece is all about the mental load. And that I feel like puts on a lot of weight um, for a lot of the reasons why I needed a drink at the end of the day. But you you hit a, a really good point with your question as um, asking for more help is really one of the biggest steps to get rid of that weight. You know, I, I feel like a lot of the times I was drinking as um, instead of trying to, um, to trying to get some more assistance. Um, so the, the weight of the world didn't feel so squarely on my shoulders. Even, I mean, with my husband, we found, we found a groove where um, we have been able to uh, balance things a, a lot better since my first a uh, child was born. Um, but not just with your partner. Um, I get help now from family. Um, I have found um, some mom friends who want to help out any way they possibly could. Um, and we help each other out. Um, um, my kids are... I've got one kid at school, one's at home. Um, but I found some at-home help. One of the conversations my husband and I had um, about the mental load was, you know, his expectations for how clean the house needs to be were different than mine, which is pretty normal in a partnership. And I said, listen, standards, we need a housekeeper because I can't, I can't take that next step. Um, I'm not going to start scrubbing toilets um, to your level because that's that's just not where my time is right now <laughs> or my energy. And he got it and we moved budget numbers around and we made a housekeeper happen because that's what I needed. Um, and that's what he needed too. So um, asking for help, I feel like really takes some of that mental load um, off our shoulders. Um, but when you do decide to take away your crutch, which for me was alcohol, you do have to find um, other, other coping mechanisms um, that aren't dangerous. <laughs> and for me, um, I have found um, my escape in exercise fitness um, is extremely important to me. And my kids know that. And I love that they know that. They, um, they, they're always trying to copy me um, when they catch me doing yoga. Um, on Sundays, it's my running day. And in the winter, I, I run on my treadmill. And they see me do that. I mean, I love that they're watching me do that. Instead of, you know, drinking a bottle of wine, <laughs> I feel like I'm giving them a little bit better, better um, of a, uh, ways to, to cope in life um, through what they see now. 
<laughs> like I said before, they also, um, I take baths. Um, I sometimes I, I will be lying on the floor meditating and I have this rule and it's mostly because I had an alcoholic father. I have a no, um, lock doors rule. Um, I just don't like that. Uh, the idea that a door is locked. So my kids walk in on me doing pretty much anything um, within reason, but um, they'll walk in while I'm running on my treadmill. They'll walk, the other day I was taking a bath and my son comes in and he starts playing with the water. And I'm like, well, this wasn't what I had planned for my relaxation bath, but I like them to see how mommy um, relaxes at the end of the day. There's nothing to hide there. So um, you just, you, you find different um, uh, ways to, to relax and to cope and you do it in a healthy way. And um, you teach your kids um, how, how mommy copes when she's really stressed out and hopefully they learn a thing or two as well. No, I love that. And I think, you know, especially with the clients that I've worked with, what becomes very apparent is that they haven't had that conversation. It's very much like, I don't want to rock the boat. You know, he's working all day and then I'm at home and I'm looking after the child and maybe I work from home, but I, you know, and, and, and it's, and it's fascinating because it's literally like, well, you're not putting yourself first. So it would suggest that you need to have a conversation about this because you're the one that it's kind of like if you are sort of the cog that makes everything work. Cause mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think when extra super powerful than men, men have their own, you know, we will have our own gifts in the world, but generally it's the mother that, that, that kind of organizes, creates, makes sure that everything in the home life is, is kind of working. And, um, and so if we're not okay, like if we're having, like we're going through something, it makes sense that the other things don't kind of work. Like they get out of sync and they're like get clogged up. And, and so there's, there's a sense that in what you're saying, and, and, and I, I think you said it right at the beginning that, that um, we've got to put ourselves first. Like, I'm not saying like selfishly saying, but there's a sense of like, actually what works for mummy. I need to go and have some time out right now. Like that's really what works for me. And I need to go and have my bath. That's what works for me. And I need to go and look after myself. And that's what works for me to be able to come in back into this space and, and give what's needed. It took me years to get here years. And, um, I remember so vividly after my first child was born and he was colicky. So it was just day after day of screaming, massive screaming. It was so stressful. And I remember thinking to myself, I need to get out of here. I need to get out of here. Um, but I didn't know what that would even look like uh, because I was breastfeeding. Um, I felt trapped. Uh, I felt trapped in this room with this baby that I hardly knew. And I had very little experience with kids. Um, This baby that needed me, and yet I could not appease him. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just wanted to run away. Um, But I was so afraid to say anything because I was so afraid that as this brand new mom, people would judge me including my husband. Um, I was so afraid that um, they would think I wasn't capable. Um, I was afraid my husband would think he made a mistake, you know, like that, oh my gosh, this woman can't even do the most natural thing on earth, be a mother. Like, um, I was so afraid. And I remember the first time I said, you know what, I want to go. It was a spin class. Um, It was a Saturday morning spin class. And I'm like, I just... I want to try this. It was my first step in saying I need to leave for a little bit. And, um, and he, of course he was totally fine with that. You know, he's like, whatever you need, whatever you need. But for me, the hardest part was, was telling my needs and saying, I need to do this for me because I was afraid of so many things. I was afraid of the, what is, I was afraid of the judgment. I was afraid of anything, but, um, you, I went away for an hour spin class and nobody missed me. 
you know, like (laughs) it was fine. And it was that, that was the first step I took towards making, making some small changes to do things that I need for my mental health. Um, my husband, before I wrote, so I wrote that letter to my husband, the dear husband, I need more help letter. Um, I wrote it the day after a really bad night um, where basically he was supposed to give me time to fall asleep um, and get some rest. Um, but my, my baby kept crying and crying. And so he's like, you know what? I can't do this. And so after like my 20 minute break, he came into the room and put the baby in a bassinet and kind of shoved it up against the bed as his way of saying, he's yours. <laughs> Your break's over. And I was so furious that the next morning I wrote this letter to him um, saying, I need more help. I need, I need a couple of hours to sleep at night. I need you to help in the morning. I need you to ask me what what the baby needs today and not just run off to work. I need this. And um, I did not share that letter with him right away. And I certainly didn't publish it for the world right away. Um, that night though, I, um, I had that conversation with him and it was the most important conversation of our lives as parents, because it was the first time I was explaining to my husband that not all of this is intuitive and that I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> which for my husband was, was news. I mean, the mommy intuition myth, that's the real deal, right? Um, people think that we have this baby and all the answers just magically come to us. And for me, they absolutely did not. And I needed a lot more help from him than I even myself had expected. So um, when we finally had that conversation, I was opening his eyes to a lot of things um, that I I did need him to step in. I did need him to hold the baby more. Um, He wasn't doing me a disservice by asking to hold the baby. I wanted him to take the baby. I wanted him to um, take the initiative to unload the dishwasher, to um, ask me um, if I need a break. Uh, Things that um, just never occurred to him because it had never been suggested before. And we were new parents. Of course, we needed to talk about this. Um, I was just so afraid of um, judgment or shame or being labeled as an unfit mom that I never had the conversation. But the... The fear was all for naught because um, my partner, all he wanted to know was what he could do. And most of the time, he was trying to stay out of my way um, because he thought that was the only thing he could do. Um, He wasn't sure what was going on either. Um, He he was a first-time father. He didn't know um, how this fatherhood fatherhood thing works. So, you know, he's letting mommy... um, run the show. And he was just waiting for direction, really. So um, I feel like once couples can have that conversation, and it's not the most natural conversation uh, in the world, but once you can finally have it, um, you can really open both the partner's eyes into how you can work more cohesively um, in this parenting thing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's so much wisdom right there. And, and it makes so much sense. And yet, <laughs> yeah. how often do we just like go, fucking hell, he's not been like doing this or doing that. And we don't actually have the conversation. And I think it's, it's interesting where this conversation has gone because I didn't expect it to open up in this way. Mm. But it makes sense in that we then, it, it kind of makes sense that if we are, it gets to a point where we need to ask for help or not, or we carry on drinking and we carry on going down the path that we're on. Um, but what I'm hearing you say and what I'm, where, where, well, what I'm hearing from this conversation is, is that there are two paths, maybe three, four, five, six, seven, but two big ones, one down that path of, of drinking and all the other path of like opening up, asking for help, getting clear on what you need. Um, being, it being okay to ask for that. Uh, you know, it's not like the movies where, baby pops out and it's all fine. And the, you know, mother takes to it and whatever. No, we, I, I, 
I was kind of reflecting on this yesterday is we do not live in the same way that we used to. So we don't live in bloody village. We don't have the family around us. Our roles are changing, have changed. There are mums out there as well as dads who are working nine to five or are basically running their own businesses to bring more money in to be able to like support themselves, so forth and so on, because there's less community in, um, in some places, especially in the big cities. Um, and yet we're expected to, we've got all of this going on and we're expected to bring up children. Like anthropology, uh, anthropologically, the way we live right now isn't designed, it's not set up for us <laughs> to have families as far that's, as I can tell. I never thought of it that way, but that's so true. One of the, the biggest things that kept me from speaking up is because that's not, this isn't how my mom did it. This isn't how my husband's mom did it. Mm-hmm. Um, our past generation that I don't, this is, I obviously can't speak for everybody, but I know for my mom and I know for my mother-in-law, they did do everything. Um, the fathers were not heavily involved. Um, the fathers did not pitch in on the household. Um, the mothers ran the show. And um, for me, a, a lot of the shame I felt was my mom could do this. Why can't I? Yeah, I so resonate with that. Mm. And that's so hard. And I still don't have the answer. And I asked my mom, <laughs> like, how did you do it? And she's like, honestly, I don't remember. And I think she was <laughs> so drained from everything. You know, she was doing all this on top of my father's alcoholism so drained that um she just doesn't i think she just didn't even have capacity to to remember she was just going through the motions because there was just so much going on um but i i mean that's a question i still wonder like how did they do it um and i feel like now um we we are blessed because we are at a time where we are working, I mean, it's not fully there, but we are working on not having the stigma tied to asking for more help and um, not having a stigma tied with um, the husbands being active or a spouse uh, being active participants in household chores um, or um, driving the kids to school, um, anything, anything kid related. Um, Spouses and partners are expected to be um, both involved. Um, And that's, I think that's a beautiful thing because it makes um, my life easier when I come in and say, here's what I need from you. Yeah, I was, I was, you know, I often talk to to my partner about this in terms of he has his, his grandmother, she had 14 children. Wow. And I'm like, what? Like, how do you... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, I have one and, 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 and only part time. And it seems to me that that's actually quite enough. Um, but that, that's, you know, each person has their own reality, right? So is, I just guess you just get on with it. Um, but um, I asked him, I said, you know, when did she have him? Like, when did she have them? She was a lot younger and and what i'm what i'm seeing more of is i hate the term and i and but but you know it's out there geriatric mothers i i don't know who coined that phrase um why it was coined that way it's horrible and it's possibly like it was put together by us mothers it's like what why are we geriatric um wiser i'd like to think that we're just wiser but there is a there is a difference between having a child at 20 21 22 you know to having them when you are the late 30s early 40s even mid 40s these days oh yeah i <laughs> i had my first child um it was a month before I was turning 35 and they still categorized it as high risk because I'm at advanced maternal age. <laughs> and um, I, I think about that a lot. I think about um, 
if, if parenting would have been easier, um, if I started a lot sooner, um, at least in terms of energy. energy. Yeah. And I like to think that for all the extra energy I would have had, I would have been lacking in some other things like um, the financial security. Um, my, both my, um, my parents and my husband's parents are retired, well retired. Um, so they have a lot more time to help which is a huge, huge bonus. Um, but there's so many benefits to um, having these kids in the later years too. Um, not to mention, you know, in my 20s, I had no idea who I was as a person. Um, I was struggling so much with self-identity. And um, I think I was far, far too selfish. Um, at that point in my life to even understand what it would mean to put another person first. Um, so there's just, um, I feel like there's so many pros and cons, but I do miss that energy <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that would have come with being um, younger. Cause it, I feel that one. I feel that one every day. Um, but you know, when we do, uh, when we go back to the sobriety, I feel like I, I did get so much energy back um, by removing um, the alcohol from my life. Um, that was one of the, the biggest factors, I feel like, because I can wake up in the morning fresh. Mm. Um, whereas um, after a couple glasses of wine the night before, my sleep was hurting. Um, yeah. headaches, all that stuff. So, um, I feel like I did get a lot of that energy back, um, from this. I, I, I was just texting with a friend last night and she's like, you know, I know I drink too much, but, um, she said the, my big, and I think I'm fine. I don't think it's affecting my kids at all. I don't think they even really see what's happening because, um, they're asleep when I first, you know, break open the bottle and by the time they wake up, I feel okay in the morning. She's like, the worst problem I've had is my sleep is mm -hmm. so messed up. And, um, and I, I know exactly what she means. Cause I used to, on top of having three or four glasses of wine, I'd have to take a sleeping pill to even fall asleep. Um, and the sleep, you know, would be so, uh, iffy that you'd be waking up. It just wasn't a deep sleep. So you he, not in addition to the drinking, you've got that going against you and being able to get a good night's sleep. I mean, there's no um, substitution for that. There's not enough coffee in the world to substitute for that. Um, and when you're a mom and I, I like to always say energy is a currency, um, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta save, uh, save up your energy. Uh, and treat it valuably. Um, I feel like that alone has been such a huge, um, a huge change for me that I'm grateful for. Um, that would make me never want to drink again. For that alone, um, not to mention you know the other hundreds of other benefits that come with it. Um, so I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I get actually get to see the sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's beautiful it's beautiful <laughs> i got to see it today because i took the dog out for a walk but like that would never have happened if well i don't know it might have happened but i would probably be going oh my god i feel really awful i have a hangover um i wouldn't have enjoyed it as much or probably even gone oh no i can't go out today or whatever Kind of something that, that came to mind again, coming back to the sobriety piece was, I know that maybe some, some mums are listening in and going, oh my God, I drink. Oh my God. Maybe it's more about me needing to ask for help because I don't feel I can. And it's very scary. Like I'm assuming, you know, there's a moment where you go, oh my God, oh my God, I, I've got to do something about this. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. What have you found that has been easier for you? Like in the sense of like, okay, that was a decision that was made. Was Did you then get help? What was the process or, or the steps you took to be able to kind of go, actually, it's not as difficult as I thought it would be. There have been surprises along the way. What are some, that, do you know what, do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, I do. Um, I want to back up a little bit because um, I think 
ever since I started sharing my sobriety story, which has only been a few months, um, I really waited till I was a year sober before I started openly talking about it, mostly because I wasn't sure where this was going. Um, I didn't know where this was leading me. And it wasn't until I was like, oh my God, you know, my life has changed so much for the better as a result of um, going dry um, that I did want to start talking about it openly and writing about it. Um, so, um, but I do get a lot of pushback um, from people that aren't either they don't have a drinking problem or they're they don't want to talk about their drinking problem. I mean, there's, there's so many different variants. Right. Um, and some people are saying, you know, stop, don't bash the mommy wine culture. I love wine, you know, leave me alone. Let me have my wine. And I think what I need to say first, before I tell you about how I got sober, um, is I don't want to bash mommy, um, having a glass of wine. And if you can have a glass of wine and be like, that felt great. Now let's get on with life. I think that's great. I mean, I I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think the American um, Medical Association, the AMA, they say a glass of wine for women a day is fine um, from what they can tell in health studies. What I had a problem with um, is I could never stop at one. Mm. Um, and I, I mean, technically I could, I never wanted to, I would never even have a glass of wine if I knew that that was the only glass I could have. Um, I did not want a glass of wine. I wanted three. And that's um, I, what I need to distinguish. Um, and I, I try to relay in my writing too. I'm not bashing people who like to enjoy a glass of wine every now and again, um, because I think that's great. If you can do it um, in a healthy way that does not impact you or the people around you, um, then um, more power to you. I was not one of those people. Um, and, um, I knew that for a while I knew that, um, I was a three or four glasses of wine person. Um, and that's for me, that's what drinking wine looked like. Um, so I want to make that dis- uh, distinction for um, the listeners because, um, I don't want people to think I want everyone to be sober. That's not, I, I need me to be sober. And that, that's, that's what my life needs to look like. Um, when I got sober, so I told you that I, um, I had that panic attack and I thought it was a stroke. And I was like, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. And my kids need me. I need me. Um, and I've seen what a stroke can do to someone's life through my father. Um, so I told my mom that very day, I think it was December 19th. I think that was the day. That's my anniversary um, of the day I got sober. So I told my mom, I said, mom, I think I'm an alcoholic. And I knew the second I said that, that I was forever pivoting, um, that my life would never be the same because my mom used to be kind of my drinking buddy. Um, I would always, you know, swing by her house for a glass of wine. What she didn't know is after I had the glass of wine with her, I went home and had another two glasses at home with my husband. Um, So when I told her that, I knew my life was going to change forever because she was she was going to be my accountability partner. Um, She was not going to let me get away with next week saying, change my mind. Um, I think I'm fine. And then um, just start drinking again. So um, for me, that was probably the most momentous thing I could have done um, to start my sobriety journey. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I'm so grateful I did because she was supportive. Of course she was, you know, she wants to see me healthy. Um, and she, she said, let's do this, you know, like, I'm holding your hand the whole way. And the first week um, is the hardest. God is the hardest week because in your, it's your head that you're fighting against. And it's your head that's telling you, what are you doing? Just, you know, pretend like that day never happened. You feel fine now. Um, there's no harm in just another couple glasses of wine. There's no harm in just drinking today. Um, so, I feel like once I could fight through those inner demons the first week or two, 
and really start to feel the effects of what my body looks, feels like sober, um, that my journey really could start taking place and the transformation could really occur. Um, so what I try to tell people who ask for encouragement is just make it through the first 21 days. You know, what the first week is basically detox and it's painful and it's hard and you need somebody holding your hand. The second week, um, it's the inner demons. And it's the third week that the inner demons start to quiet down and you can see the transformation and it's beautiful. And I feel like once I got through those first few weeks and I started to get my energy back, I started to um, um, have some clarity. The fog in my brain was going down. Um, even my anxiety started to go down um, because... Um, Alcohol is a depressant. <laughs> it doesn't help if if you're struggling with um, sadness or uh, moods um, or anxiety. So um, once I started to feel the benefits, the reality of what I was doing and how it was such a good thing started to come to place. Um, but I do feel like it took me a whole year to feel like this is where my life is going to go. Um, because you do have to make a lot of huge changes. Um, I had to rethink my friendships. Um, I had to rethink, um, what social activities are going to look like. Um, I tried to do everything, um, quietly. I did not want friends and family to really know that I wasn't drinking anymore. But I also didn't want them to think I was pregnant. So it was it was a balancing <laughs> act. Um, so, you know, it, it was going to social um, parties um, with a death grip over a bottle of water or a kombucha saying, no, I'm good. I have a drink. Thanks. And, you know, just finding what your new life is going to look like with this um, with this completely new lifestyle. That honestly, a lot of people and society doesn't encourage exactly. Um, you do. I got a lot of pushback from people saying, "Come on, just have a drink." Um, mostly because people had never seen me without a drink, <laughs> so it was all a whole different person. But I, I have made a lot of drinking buddies over the years. So um, for them, it was hard to see me without a drink, and for them, it was a little, a bit of a threat to see someone in their drinking buddy group who wasn't drinking um, because it made them uncomfortable. Mm. So, you know, I, I feel like it took a whole year to find who I was as this new person um, and who my friends were and um, what life would look like on the day-to-day -day at home. Um, my friend from last night was asking me, does your husband still drink? And he does, but Barely. Um, he does, he's never been somebody who likes to drink alone. And now that I'm not drinking, um, I, I really only see him grab a glass of wine at social occasions. Um, so my transformation has transformed him a little bit. Not that he was ever um, a big drinker, but it's changed his lifestyle um, just naturally. Um, and and I feel like it's just been so good for my kids, too, just to witness this for themselves. Um, anytime we have a, a social occasion, they get to see everybody holding a glass of wine. And I don't want them to see that at home, too. They don't need to see us constantly um, with a death grip over a bottle or, or wine. They, they need to know that um, there is a life... Um, there is a sober life out there that's still good and it's still um, satisfying. Mm. We don't see that in the advertisements. We don't see that in um, a lot of the culture we live with right now. It's interesting because I, this whole thing around gravitating, you know, ch changing friendships and so forth and so on. What I've, what I found is, is do you naturally gravitate towards people that don't drink? As, as time goes on, it's weird. It just sort of happens naturally. It's kind of oh. like a thing where it's like, yeah, you just kind of gravitate towards those people. The other thing I was going to sort of, sounds like this year has been a massive exploration for you, like the inquiry of who am I without the drink and 
what does that look like? What do I, what do I like? What I don't like? Um, it's given you real space to explore. And something that, that kept sort of during this entire conversation that I really wanted to ask actually is because obviously self-medication is a way of not feeling what you don't want to like not having to feel what you don't want to feel. And so I'm curious about that. Have you found that actually it's not as scary as you thought it would be in terms of, because we all have moments where we feel uncomfortable, where we feel feelings that we don't want to feel, but some of us uh, choose to just feel them anyway and kind of go, okay, just having a shit day today. Or how has your relationship to your feelings have changed? They're not as scary as I always envision them to be. Um, that's for sure. The low lows aren't as um, as life and death as I previously. <laughs> it's interesting because you know I feel more feelings, but since I've gone sober, I cry less, which I'm really surprised about. Um, and I think it's because my um, my body isn't having as many mood swings. Um, I'm not. Um, constantly high and then low and then high and then low. Um, it's just more plateaued. Like I, I have found kind of this, um, my anxiety has gone down. And as a result, um, I just, um, I think I take things more in stride. Um, I did, I had a horror, like probably one of the worst experiences of my life last spring. So I was about four months sober at that point where uh, my husband and I received horrendous judgment and shaming um, from someone in the school system. And um, it was one of the worst days of my life. Um, and that was a really low low. And all I can think of looking back on it is thank God I wasn't drinking not only before that day, but that night and the days to follow, because I was able to make extremely important decisions during that time that I needed a clear brain for. And, um, also, and I don't, I haven't talked about this yet, but with my sobriety, the thing that I have released almost completely from my heart is the guilt that comes with being a drinking mom. That guilt that just eats at you and eats at you. And every morning when you wake up with the, the headache, um, it's just in your stomach. Um, and it hurts because you're like, I am a, I'm a crappy mom. I'm a crappy mom. Um, my kids don't deserve me. My kids don't deserve me. Uh, what am I doing with my life? Um, that, um, that melts away. You, I mean, you do find guilt for doing other things <laughs> that you do crappy um, because we're human. But um, to not to release that guilt for me was a huge thing. And for me to be able to go through this massive, horrendous uh, experience and not have that guilt weighing on me or even questioning, like, I wonder if this still would have happened if, um, if, I, if I hadn't been drinking those past couple months um, was such a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to take that experience as much in stride as I possibly could. Um, but I was able to make really important decisions. Me and my husband were able to um, communicate really openly about what we wanted to do about this. And um, we were able to move forward um, in a smart, healthy, intelligent way that I feel like if I had the wine fog um, pushing back on me or at least limiting the amount of time I could put into thought and feeling, um, I wouldn't be able to make the smartest choice um, or at least I would have questioned it later. Yeah, I, I, I love the fact that you kind of saw that your feelings aren't actually that scary. Um, I think often we can, we can make these feelings into something that they're not and not belittling that because of, you know, life is a contact sport and it does look really scary at times. But what I've, what I've noticed at least is um, the more I've got comfortable with feeling uncomfortable feelings, uh, the less scary they look and, and the more I can just be 
because literally I would feel an uncomfortable feeling and I would be like, oh my God, I need to have a drink because I don't want to feel this right now. And, and there's a different dialogue with the feelings now. It's a bit like, oh, hello. (laughs) This feels really fucking uncomfortable. I'm just going to go and, I don't know, make myself a cup of tea or, or watch something on Netflix or just give my son a hug or, cause I know it will pass. You got to work through it now. Yeah. Um, whereas I feel like with the, the drinking, you're numbing it for a few hours and then you get to feel it times 10 uh, the next day. Um, and you can decide if you're going to drink through it that day or if you're going to cope with it then. Um, the feelings don't go away. They just wait for, um, they wait till you're ready <laughs> to, to start um, working through it. Um, it's, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, the feelings can still be uncomfortable, um, but we live in a weird world where um, we're not encouraged to work through them in our head. We're encouraged to numb them um, and, or escape them altogether. And um, that's not healthy. And and you can't, they, they can't go away forever. They'll just find other ways to come out of you. Yeah. And feelings come, you know, uncomfortable feelings come and go that that's just what they do. And so there's nothing to be, it's a bit like, you know, the, the, what you were talking about, sort of the shame that we feel that we're not good enough um, because we don't know um, or that we're supposed to like do it all on our own and we don't. And, and what I found is, is that when you actually open up a conversation about this, the shame source just seems to dissolve because actually it's attempting to suppress it, like put it under the carpet, deny it, shove it down, put it out of view. You kind of know it's there, <laughs> you know, and, and it's still there. It's not, but actually being able to sh- feel it, um, talk about it, um, make love to it, embrace it, um, be with it. It takes all of the angst away in a way, like the added angst on top of it. Yeah. It doesn't eat at you, um, the way it would, if you were trying to suppress it. Yeah. Um, and you're doing yourself such a, a, a service by um, getting through it sooner rather than later um, for the long term, I feel like. There's a beautiful quote which um, that kind of really resonates for me on this particular topic. Um, the quote is this, if the only thing people learned was not to be afraid of their experience, that alone would change the world. Wow. And it sounds so simple. Well, it is. <sighs> and then, then why are we constantly trying to avoid the feelings? Because we think that actually they say something else. So we don't know that they're feelings. So we don't know that they're just our thinking. We think they, they're solid things that are going on like we truly believe what we think as opposed to just seeing them for what they are which is just energy come passing through yeah that's a great way to look at it it's energy passing through and uh the sooner we can talk through it and and get through the discomfort that comes with it the sooner we can um dissolve its power Mm -hmm. Uh, but when we just let it sit inside of us Um, it just starts to eat away at us and um, drain us in a different way that's far less healthy. Um, so we got to avoid that at all costs. Yeah, which which is, you know, why feel what you feel and the way that you feel it, but know that it's not something you need to be scared of because it's, it, it will go. It just comes and goes like clouds, you know, like we all have moments where we have like, oh, and then we, oh, okay. Oh, and then it, oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's part of the human condition. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, embrace it. Um, yeah. But to know that you're not on your own and that actually we all experience it in that way. Um, Celeste, this has been amazing. Like, if so, someone's listening in and they'd love to connect with you, know more about your blog, where can they go and experience you? Oh yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm all over social media. Um, you can find me on my website and what a mom.com. 
<laughs> like he's a mom and what a mom. <laughs> Um, I'm also on Instagram under that same handle, and what a mom. Um, on Facebook, um, you can all find this through my website, but on Facebook, I'm under Celeste Vaughn, the Ultimate Mom Challenge. And um, yeah, look me up. I I've tried to uh, reflect all my social media for different audiences and different stories. So I don't keep it redundant. Uh, my Instagram is more of a play into my day to day. And I like to show off my kids, absolutely <laughs> wild personalities um, and the crazy messes they leave for me. Um, my Facebook, I post, um, a lot of my um, down, deep, and dirty stories, um, and I share my heart. Um, and then my blog is um, kind of just sharing a piece of my soul. I am working on a book. Um, it is about the mommy drinking culture and about my sober story. Um, so you'll get all that info um, on my website if you subscribe um, for my emails. But you had it here first. <laughs> I, yeah. So thank you, Celeste, so much for your heart, for your soul, for being here today and for sharing your story, which is just beautiful in, in many ways. So thank you. And for everybody that's been listening in, I hope you got as much out of it as we did. And until the next time, bye-bye for now. And there you have it. Another wonderful episode of The Joy of Being. If you loved what you heard here today and it's been helpful, why not subscribe or share the podcast with others? And if you're curious as to how you can experience more joy in your life and feel carefree, then I invite you to download your Joy Catalyst Scorecard at www.marinapearson.com slash scorecard, which will help you identify the joy gaps and what you can do to fill them. And remember, you can find me on Instagram at Marina Pearson or my Facebook group, The Joy of Being. So until next week's episode, remember, you are the joy you seek.